Uh, hello brothers and sisters, uh, just doing uh, another video on uh, false doctrines of the born-again church. There's there's some uh, teachings going on, this is in the Protestant church as well, um, which make them anti-Catholic, and um, some things they're right about and some things they're wrong about. And uh, see, if we're in wrong and we judge someone, uh, we'll also get judged, because the Bible says to judge righteously. We're allowed to convict of sin if we're right, but if we're in the wrong... Um, this can stop you from uh, getting your prayers answered and getting blessed. You know, you say, God, why haven't you answered my prayers? This could be it. So uh, just uh, uh, exploring so some of the things that the, the church has got wrong, and it's because they didn't use the um, Bible as their datum. They they borrowed doctrines from some of the Protestant church or, or, or traditions instead of looking at the Bible themselves, which they should have done. And... Uh, we're going to deal with those spirits of tradition and religion as well. So praise the Lord. There'll be deliverance at this, so uh, stay tuned. Don't get offended yet. Listen to the whole thing before uh, making comment. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe it's going to be a positive outlook, though. Um, a lot of people say, uh, oh, Catholic Church is wrong because they have statues in their temple, and the Word of God says don't make an image of anything on the earth or underneath the earth uh, uh, or, or any image of God. However... Uh, let's look at Exodus uh, 25, verse 18, and it says, You shall make two cherubim of gold and make them of hammered work at the ends of the mercy seat. Uh, God actually commanded uh, the Hebrew people to make statues of cherubim, things in the heaven, for the temple. And again in verse 19, it says, Make one cherubim at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. So God actually asked them to make statues of the cherubim for his temple. So uh, this, oh, you can't have statues in the temple? Wrong. Wrong. That Someone sowed that to sow discord in the church. And they, they're they probably going to burn in hell for that. Now, in saying that, absolutely, you shouldn't worship them. You should only worship God. But sometimes God wants statues in his temple. You know, like he beautifies his temple, you know. It's it's not a bad thing to have a statue in the temple. So uh, we're just pulling down strongholds uh, of the devil here right now. Uh, 2 Chronicles 3, 11. There's more scriptures. Look at them. Research it yourself. Look into it yourself. There'll be more. The wingspan of the cherubim was 20 cupids. The wing of one of five cupids touched the wall of the house, touched the wall of the temple, and its other wing of... Five cupids touch the wing of the other cherub. Now I'm going to go to the next uh, false belief here. It says it's wrong to spend all that money on the church. It's lined with gold and marble and you could have put gave that money to the poor. Look, look what they're doing. They're greedy and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I don't think they're any greedier than people trying to raise money in, in the temple for personal jets. And when they already got one. I think that's wrong, and yet you defend them and you criticize the Catholic Church, who is not the, this, this spending it for everyone. And the Word of God, actually, um, God sent a, a prophet, Haggai, uh, uh, and this is chapter 1, verses 3 to 11, and, he, and he, he says that the church was poor because they built their own houses, but they left his house in ruins. So God wanted them to beautify his temple on the earth. You know? So people say, oh, oh, God doesn't care about the church anymore. You know, we're the temple of his Holy Spirit. We shouldn't spend a cent on it. You know, we're, you know, it's not important to go to church. The Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Where do you gather together? In a church. So uh, uh, just, I'll, I'll read the scriptures here. Now, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, it is time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins, question mark. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is there to warm you. And he who earns wages earns to put it into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins. For every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above will withhold the dew, and the earth withhold its fruit. 
For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on every where the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labour of your hands. So God, God's saying, you know, if you don't put money into my temple, you know, to beautify, to make a nice place of me, I'll withhold your blessing. I will not bless the work of your hands. I will cause drought. God actually says that, yeah? Is this relevant New Testament as well? Yes, it is. You know, you see these, I mean, Pentecostal Protestant churches criticizing them for having nice cathedrals, which God ordained and they got visions from heaven to make them, you know? You know, there's no way they, they could put all that stuff into a temple without God being involved, you know? Uh, and, you know, you criticize them for your temples, but look at yours. You, you know, you, you, you do church in a rec center, and the place is falling to bits while you pocket all the money. You know? what? How hypocritical is that? You know, the ministers are pocketing all the money to buy jets, and his house lays in ruins. It's a shed. You know? Now, uh, there's another criticism of, uh, they say uh, that uh, communicating with saints is necromancy, talking with the dead, the Bible for, 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 forbids it. But we clearly see in the word of God, though, Jesus talked with saints and didn't sin. In Luke 9, 28 to 36, now it came to pass about the eighth day after these sayings that he took Peter, John and James. These were in his circle. Uh, he, he, when he did miracles, he shut some people out, like when he was raising the dead. But he took these ones when they did the big miracles. So these ones had big faith. He doesn't do miracles for everyone unless they have faith. If there's no faith, there's no miracles. And went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed... The appearance of his face was altered and his robe white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those who were with him were heavy with the sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. So they saw him as a God in the flesh and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus master it's good for us here and let us to make three tabernacles one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah not knowing that he said while while he was saying this a cloud came over and overshadowed them and they were fearful as they entered the cloud that's the the presence of the Lord that's the glory cloud and a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son he, hear him when the voice had ceased Jesus was found alone but they kept quiet and told no one in those days anything of these which they've seen. So, so we see uh, on the transfiguration, Jesus spoke with dead saints. Moses and Elijah, they appeared with him. So there's a biblical, Jesus never sinned. The Bible said he was sinless. So if God sends them to speak with you, so long as you can discern they're actually from God, they're not a demon. Yeah, of course you can speak with them. Sure, Jesus did, you know. He's not a respecter of persons. If you believe you can have visitations, you'll get them. Now, uh, holy water, not biblical, some say. According to Numbers chapter 5, verse 17, the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. Uh, holy water is great for blessing objects. Uh, it's great for driving out demons. Demons hate it. Especially when you drink it. Even when you splash it on something. Demons hate it. They go wild. You see them wildly manifest and come out. Demons hate holy water. I, I recommend you watch online uh, how to make it yourself. It's good. It's good stuff. Holy water is biblical. The holy communion, uh, you know, has to be taken as the literal body and blood of Christ for eternal life. Jesus said that. I'm going to read the scripture to you. Now, I've noticed in the Protestant church and in a lot of the bonnet born again churches, they say, take, eat this, this is a symbol of his body, this is a symbol of his blood. They don't actually believe it's the body and blood of Christ when they pray over it. This is very, very bad. This is not in line with scripture. I'm going to read the scripture, which proves it. John 6, uh, 53 to 58. Then Jesus said, and the most surely I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. He says you need to do it to have eternal life. Why would you gamble with your salvation? Just eat his flesh and drink his blood. I'm going to go further into this. And I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, 
blood abides in me. You know, we have to abide in him to bear fruit. You know? And I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna, and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. So, there you go. Now, when he did call the communion, uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 26, uh, 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them his disciples and said take eat this is my body he said this is my body his literal body spiritually it, it when, when you pray over the sacraments of holy communion they come the body and blood of christ if you believe if you don't they have no power you will not receive eternal life that's what the word of god says eat eat take this not symbolic you got to take it literally you got to pray over it literally that's transformed when you pray over it then he, who, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood. He didn't say it's a symbolic of my blood, or the wine, or, or grape juice. He says, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth his fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new in my Father's in, in heaven, in my Father's kingdom in heaven. So uh, here's another thing as well. Uh, you know, they claim, they go, oh, the Catholic Bible's corrupted because it rubs out uh, idolatry and all this sort of stuff. And uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, you know, but I will say this. They keep the Apocrypha in their Bible. Yeah, that's over 100 chapters, which was removed from the Protestant born again Bible. It was in the original 1611 King James Version, and it is important for the Bible. It is the word of God, and I could prove it. Martin Luther did this to divide the church. You know, because without the Apocrypha, in the, in the, you do not know the third beast of Daniel, which was the Greeks. You need the book of Maccabees to see that. Also, spirit wives and husbands, which we cast out in deliverance ministry, is only mentioned in the book of Tobit. So, uh, and uh, also the reason why he removed this as well, he criticized the church Martin Luther did because of their giving of arms for the dead. He said this was a rort. However, this is actually found in the Apocrypha. It's found in the New Testament as well, you know, about not coming out of uh, prison if you offend your brother until you pay the last farthing. So it's in the New Testament as well. But he purposely did it to divide the church permanently. And we need to reconcile. We, we need to get along. We need to pray together. We need to fast together. I'm not suggesting uh, some uh, big whore of Babylon where we compromise the word, but we've got to go back to the word of God and agree and get on with one another. We need to in these end times. So uh, let's look at purgatory. And this is what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's works of what it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a ward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So our works are going to be tested whether they're good or evil. We're going to be rewarded according to the good and evil that we do here. So... Now, if we look at the Latin, Dios Puros, or Purgatorium in Medieval Latin, where we get the word purgatory. Dia means through. You know, I just read through the fire. We're going to be tested through the fire. Pyros means fire. Means a we're going through a fire. There's a place of fire where, we're, where our works are tested, whether they're good or evil, whether they're rotten God or not. Um, and we'll be rewarded according to that. And, and if you look at the Sermon on the Mounts, Jesus clearly says, you know, that if you offend your brother, you know, reconcile with him, give a gift, yeah, because you won't get out of jail until you pay the uttermost farthing. So the there was alms givings and offerings for, for, for getting out of that place of penance and purgatory. There's restitution in the Bible as well. That's not taught in the church. Uh, 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 what was his name? Uh, not Nicodemus. Uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. 
He said, I'll restore full form of what I stole. If you've stolen something, it's not good just to repent. You've got to pay it back, you know, and you give them interest. You've got to make it right. You've got to make things right with your brother. And, and, and if you offend your brother, you're not putting a, a prison, are you? So Jesus was talking about this place of purgatory. And, and even, even on the cross, when that thief died on the cross, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, that couldn't have been in heaven because Jesus went in the heart of the earth for three days. That's where Jesus went. And he, and he preached to the uh, Old Testament saints there. It says that in the, in the book of, uh, I think it's in the book of Peter. So if the thief was where he was, he was in the prison under the earth. Possibly paying for his sins. Yes, we are forgiven, Lord. Uh, you know, or we're washing the blood. We are saved, you know. Um, but there is consequences for our sins. We need to confess and turn from them. You know, and so in some cases there needs to be restitution. That's a biblical fact. Now I'm going to look at uh, where offerings were made in the in the apocrypha for the dead. You know, now uh, in, in the Maccabees, uh, I believe it was Judas Maccabees, Second uh, Maccabees, uh, twelve forty three to forty five. He also took up a collection man by man to the amount of two thousand uh, drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide a for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honourably, taking account of the resurrection, for he. W- for if he were not except that those who had fallen would rise out uh, for it for if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead so he's praying on behalf of he's interceding for them and and giving an offering asking God to have mercy on them uh, and the reason he did this was because they found with idols on them when they were dead but if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sin. I mean, I was, you know, if someone's lived a sinful life in Christ, I, I was, I make intercession for him. I say, Lord, wash in your blood, forgive them their sins, and I repent on their behalf. And, and I just use the, the blood of Jesus as a currency. We can do that as well. You know, but but do pray for them. If 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 they weren't living a proper surrendered life, you you need to pray for them, Luke, because that they could be in a place of suffering. Now the Bible, uh, uh, also in the book of Tobit twelve nineteen uh, twelve nine, it says for arms that's giving of uh, gifts, financial gifts, both delivered from death and shall purge away all sin. Those that exercise arms and righteousness shall be filled with life. So. Uh, now, uh, it says here that also that no unclean person shall enter heaven. That is why certain people won't inherit the kingdom of God, talked about in the New Testament. Revelation 20, 21, uh, 27. But nothing unclean will enter, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So nothing unclean will enter. Nothing unclean will enter the kingdom of God. So that's why there's a refiner's place of fire uh, after death, yeah? If we're not repentant and right with God and living godly lives, there's a, there's a place of uh, uh, refiner's, a place that we don't want to go. Now, uh, it talks about uh, how purgatory is under the earth, you know, because, you know, there was people are not bowing down in hell confessing Jesus as Lord and praising him. As we see in Philippians 2, 10 to 11, it says... So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth. Why would they be worshipping Satan in, in hell? And we know there's different rooms in hell. Then we know there's a place for the Old Testament saints. And we know there's purgatory now. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and under the earth and in the sea. And all that is in them singing to one seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessed and honour. Uh, be blessed and honour and glory. Might and forever and ever. Revelations 5.13. It clearly states there's people praising God under the earth. You wouldn't be praising him if you were in hell. So, uh, so here we go. We're going to move on to the next one. Here, here, here's that uh, the scripture I was talking about that Jesus talked about. Matthew 5.26. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's when you offend a brother, uh, an offering for sin. 
I understand Jesus is that offering, but there's there's meant to be restitution. Uh, 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 and and if you haven't worked out that out, that out that situation that sin out before you die, well, uh, you're going to need someone to intercede for you, uh, unless you want to be punished after. You know, for, for the sin that you committed. God is a just God. No one's getting away with anything. We need to repent and turn from our sins. We need to be. That's why the word God says, "Godly sorrow works for repentance." I've seen people trying to give up alcohol and drugs in the church, and until they're to that point of brokenness and crying out to God. God, God lets them be broken. He doesn't. They just don't just confess and that's it. They've got to. They have to suffer. A lot of them have to suffer. You know, penance. It's real, and we see that in the life of Paul. You know, he he was stoned to death, and God raised him from that. He was shipwrecked and naked. He 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 ended up getting martyred, all because he persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was penance. There was a consequence for his sins, even though he was saved. Praise the Lord. Uh, so the. So the, the the gospel was preached to the devil. Obviously, they weren't in hell. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, that that was for the thief in cross. He said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." That certainly was not hell. Uh, 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 and he rose on the third day. So if he was with him on that day, it had to be somewhere that wasn't heaven. Uh, and and we know he went into the heart of the earth. Now, uh, one Peter four six states, "For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead." That through, that though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. That was talking about when Jesus preached to them in prison uh, under the earth. Uh, 1 Peter uh, 3.19 In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison under the earth. That's when he died. Yeah. Uh, the Protestant Church and the Born Again Church often reject the Latin because they say it's a vulgar language. Yet it was on the cross. Uh, I'm going to read that now. Uh, and uh, I don't actually have the Bible verse, but it's in there. You, go look it up yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, how I missed that, but it says now Polite, Polite wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek and Latin. So if you listen to church traditions, they say, oh, oh that's a, you don't listen to that Catholic stuff. Oh, they've got Latin and uh, it's a vulgar language and all that sort of. Why did God put it in the Bible? Why was that inscription King of the Jews in Latin on the cross as well as Greek and Hebrew? God was sending us a message that the Catholic church is his church. Even if it's backslidden, there's just as many backslidden people in the Protestant church. We all need to repent. We all need to turn from our sins. You know, you look at the log in your brother's eye, you look at the, the, the speck in your brother's eye and there's a log in your own. We need to, we, you know, we need to judge righteously. And I'm showing, I'm, I'm pulling down those strongholds of un, unbelief, you know. God's using the foolish things to this world to confound the wise. Now, the word rapture is actually Latin. Hapazo is actually the Greek. So, interesting thing there. Now, uh, it, the, the people say, well, where's the word Catholic in the Bible? Well, uh, Acts 9, 31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea, that word throughout all, uh, is uh, uh, Catholicos, uh, from the Greek. It's in Greek, which means universal, which, which, which we get the modern word Catholic from. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's in the Bible. It appears almost a hundred times uh, if you look it up. Um, that's just one example. And and the first letter uh, that uh, Paul wrote was uh, in the Bible was uh, to the church in Rome. It was the Roman Church, so Roman Catholic. So people say, "Well, that's not his church." Oh, look at all the idolatry. Well, there's idolatry, but the Protestant Church, the Born Again, did it as well. He said, "Keep my Sabbath day holy." What's that? It's the seventh day. It's a Saturday. So uh, you, you're in the same sort of sin. Uh, in, instead of adding to the word of God, you've actually removed because you removed the uh, Holy Communion. Some churches have removed the water baptism, like the Salvation Army. They said it's not important. Jesus said in there, Mark 16, on the Great Commission, he says, he whoever believes in is baptized. He's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, water baptized. So he says you need to be water baptized. He says you need to do Holy Communion properly. He says you need to follow him. He says you need to repent, repent for the kingdom of God. Is that? He's, you know, so people just say, well, well I've confessed since I received the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, he says you've you got to obey him in all things. You've got to surrender your life. 
Do not conform to this world, but be transformed with a renewing mind. Presenting your body a living sacrifice. Who you marry, where you live, and what you do for a living are not your choices. You need to surrender that to God and find out your will for his life and marry who he tells you to marry. Work what you tell him to, what he tells you to work as, and go and fellowship where he tells you to. It's not your choice. You, you're not of yourself. You're bought with a price that says that your body doesn't belong to you. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've got to surrender your life. That, that's not taught in church. So that's another false doctrine. We need to surrender. So there you go. Now, Jesus gave Peter apostolic uh, authority and power over the church, chief apostolic power. He said unto them, but who do you say that I am, Simon Peter answered? And he said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And also, I say to you, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, will not, shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on the earth shall be loose in heaven. Matthew 16, 15 to 19. Now Jesus called Peter the rock. If you look up that name Peter in the concordance as well, it also means rock. Now in the Bible, it calls God the rock. He's the rock of ages. Look up in the Old Testament. Go search for yourself. It'd be a good Berean. Check it out. So he was given him authority over the church when he left. This is why he said, whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loose in He gave him full apostolic authority over the church. In other words, he was the Pope. No. Gave him full control. Not, not to Paul. Even Paul went to him in the book of Acts. He, he, he took counsel off Peter. So anyone saying, oh, no, 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 no. he wasn't saying that. Well, uh, you know, you know, he, he gave him authority to make the rules, to, to rule over the church. He did. That's a fact. Now it says, uh, go look up the scriptures in Old Testament about God being the rock. Uh, so we should confess sin. We shouldn't confess sins to a priest. Uh, uh, that's what uh, the people in the church say, but that's not what the Bible says. James five fourteen to sixteen. It says, "Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Who are the elders? Priests, pastors. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if you've committed any sins, it'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another, and pray for another one, that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So you confess your sins who to an elder of the church. People just take one verse." Cherry pick, and they say, oh, well, just confess your sins one another. No, read the whole thing. It says, confess it to an elder of the church. That's what it says. Now, it says, some people say, well, you can't confess your sins to a man. That's not what the Bible says. John 20 to 23, he said this to his uh, disciples. Whosoever sins you remit are remitted, and unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So, a minister can forgive sins and give absolution. That is biblical. Jesus gave them that authority as ministers. Now, it says, if you confess your sins and... You are forgiven. If it's conditional promise, you have to confess and turn from them. And, you know, and I'll reveal that as well. 1, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if, you, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Proverbs 28, 13 actually reveals what re true repentance is. And it's not just the change of thought. He says, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsake them will have confession. You won't even prosper if you don't turn from your sins. You have to confess and turn from them. That's the proper definition. Not this lie in the church that it's just a change of thought. It's a change of action as well, or you will not prosper. So I just want to say a prayer of repentance now for all those who've criticized the Catholic Church and it's stopping them from receiving the Holy Ghost or it's given them a false Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, forgive us for believing lies of the devil and false doctrines and traditions of the church. We renounce the spirit of tradition, the spirit of religion, the spirit of apathy, the spirit of pride and Leviathan. We renounce all false doctrines of the devils. Father God, humble us. Show us, Lord Jesus, the, 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 the doctrines that are actually of you in the Catholic Church and of the Protestant Church, Lord Jesus. Show us the truth in your word and deliver us from these false beliefs. In Jesus' name, I bind these spirits to renounce them. We cast them out. Go into the pit in Jesus' name. Go into the pit in Jesus' name. If there's anything I don't know, teach me the right way in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, set me free from the spirit of religion and, uh, and tradition. For Father God, the word of God says, the Father God, that whosoever shall call him on the name of Lord shall be saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost with and speak in tongues. And, and if my video doesn't cut off now, sometimes it cuts off at a, a 30 minute mark. I don't know why it does that, um, but I'll, I'll have a crack. I'll, I'll try a salvation prayer now. If not, I'll do a, um, a, if not, just go to my video, share this with a loved one you want saved. But say this prayer with me if you want for, uh, uh, eternal life. Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins and turn for them. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again for my justification. I make him my Lord and Savior. I receive your Holy Spirit now and turn from sins. 
In Jesus' mighty name, I believe I'm saved. Receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Say that prayer, believe you received it, and you'll be saved. Forgive and amen.